I'm sure I won't get through 80 slides, but the information's there in case you want to refer to it back later. All right, so the outline of today is going to be Ramsey theory of the bare space, and then Ellen Tech space, Matthias forcing, and Ramsey ultrafilters and their connections to each other. Then topological Ramsey spaces, what are they and why are people afraid of them? Mm -hmm. uh, you should not be afraid of them. Um, applications, there's a, book, there's a whole book of them, yes. Yeah, that's a, but, here. well, <laughs> it doesn't seem to. I've, 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 people are tentative about getting into it. Um, applications of topological Ramsey spaces, and I actually will be talking about some of my work today, but um, my more recent stuff will be on Thursday. Um, properties of L of R of U, where U was some ultrafilter forced over L of R and some other stuff. And so we'll begin at the beginning with the pigeons. So the pigeonhole principle, when I first heard about this as an undergraduate at Berkeley, I thought they must be kidding. This can't be a technical term, but it is. So pigeonhole principle, if you're given infinitely many pigeons and two holes, then one of the holes has to contain infinitely many pigeons. I'm not doing anything really finite today. Or more formally, if you have a coloring of the natural numbers into two colors, then there's going to be one of the colors containing infinitely many natural numbers. All right, so graphically, you can look at it as a graph. And that was a pun intended. Um, and that is red, and that's blue. The red didn't really show up so well here. Um, but given a coloring of pairs of natural numbers into red and blue, you can color the pairs by an edge between them. And then Ramsey's theorem says that there is a complete subgraph on infinitely many vertices with one color for all the edges. OK, so um, what's really cool about one of the really cool things about Ramsey theory is that it was motivated by a problem of logic. And if you go back to Ramsey's original paper, you'll see that he was you know, one of these people that was working on Hilbert's and Scheidung's problem. And back then, you know, it was a little bit um, before um, <clears throat> Church and Turing, they wanted to know whether there was a procedure for determining whether a given first order logic formula is valid. And Ramsey applied, he first proved his theorem, the infinite version, and then he proved the finite version from the infinite version. And then he used it to solve uh, this problem for pi 1 formulas. So there is a decision procedure for pi 1 formulas based on Ramsey's theorem, which is pretty cool. So the Hungarian notation, which People always say in talks, either you hate it or you love it. I'm sort of agnostic about it. It's there. It's useful. Um, and once you get used to it, it's useful to use. And um, so this notation, omega arrows, omega kr, is going to say that for any coloring of the k size subsets of omega into r colors, there's an infinite subset with one color. OK. And uh, can Ramsey's theorem be extended to colorings of omega to the omega? So democracy in America right now, though I shouldn't say anything political on tape. All right. All right. Hey, um, it's a trick question. I was going to have you vote. Let's not. Um, <laughs> so under the axiom of choice, there's going to be a coloring so that for every um, infinite subset, you can you have to have both colors on there. Um, but in models of determinacy, this is a is a called a strong partition cardinal, right? And they do exist. So, if you get rid of choice, the answer is yes. And if you have choice outright, the answer is no. But even oh, and and this so this is the notation. But even if you do have choice, if you restrict yourself to colorings of definable types, then you may still get some infinite Ramsey theory. So that's what we're going to talk about 
today. And uh, n is going to be the bare space, which we're going to think of as infinite subsets of omega and listed in increasing order. And the metric topology or product topology, okay, the one you're used to. And the first, um, the first breakthrough in this, this type of work was by Nash Williams, where he showed that every clope and subset of the bare space is Ramsey. Okay, and what we mean by Ramsey. So my definitions are in blue. It's a little bit maybe not so contrasted here, but if you can pick that out, my definitions are going to be in blue. And what we mean by Ramsey is that when you have a subset X of N, then for each infinite subset, there's a smaller infinite subset, which we'll call a cube, uh, such that it's either contained in X or disjoint from X, right? So either in color zero or color one. So um, Clopin sets are coded by fronts. And what is a front? Glad you asked. It's a collection of finite subsets of omega so that every infinite subset of, of, of omega is approximated by some initial segment, which is an F. And Nash-Williams property, which says that no distinct members of F and extend each other. Okay. And so I've put this, this, this uh, theorem back up. And I am actually going to go through an outline of the proof because this is a mini course. and. It may not be something you've seen before. So Nash Williams theorem. So the proof, and I'm going to call this proof sketch. OK, so we're going to let f be a front. And then we want to take a partition of the front. So let's let f not be some subset. And then we'll let F. We'll let F1 equal F minus F naught. So we've got a partition of our front into two pieces. And what we want to do is find an infinite subset of natural numbers so that the front restricted to that infinite subset is contained in one of these two pieces of the partition. OK. And for notation, we're going to have S and T be finite sets, so I don't have to keep writing this. <clears throat> and M and N being infinite sets. All right. So I see I should have used the front board first. All right, so we're going to talk about accepting and rejecting. And this is not a psychology course. <laughs> but, uh, so we're going to say that M accepts S if there is a member of F0. So we're fixing F0. Right, you really do all of this with uh, respect to some finite uh, with some collection of finite subsets of omega. Okay, so we fix what we want to accept or reject with respect to. Right now it's going to be F naught. And um, so it's going to ex uh, accept S if there's going to exist a T and F naught such that S is compatible with T. So one of them end extends the other and T is contained an S union M. Okay. Then M is going to reject S 
if it does not accept s. All right, but then the third one, which is more important, is that m is going to strongly accept s. If for every infinite subset, n accepts s. Okay, and these are the ideas behind combinatorial forcing. As you'll see, this proof was 1965. It was around the time of forcing, but this is like a pre-forcing idea. Yes? Is this n a subset of them? What? Yes. Very important. <laughs> okay, so it's the idea of combinatorial forcing and and our lemma, first lemma is that if there is no subset of M um, rejecting S, then N must strongly accept S. Which, if you think about it for a minute, it just follows from the definition, really. Okay, but it's a useful fact to notice. And then we're going to say that M decides S if either M strongly accepts S or M rejects S. Okay. And then the idea is that you want to make an infinite set which is going to decide for all of its finite subsets, right? And you can do that by some diagonalization argument. I'm going to just put this up here. Okay. So lemma two is that every infinite subset of omega can be refined to some infinite subset which decides all members of m to the less than omega, okay? So you do that by a diagonalization argument. You start with the empty set, shrink, take the next, you know, the, the first element of that, shrink, take the least element of that, then you have to take two, shrink, keep going. And this is like the first diagonalization argument which we're talking about today. And um, Stavo once said basically his book is, uh, you know, however many pages of diagonalization arguments. I mean, <laughs> in very fancy forms and many, but, but this is the basic idea behind Ramsey spaces is diagonalizing, getting what you want, keeping going, and finding some infinite set that behaves nicely. Okay. All right, so then lemma three is that if M strongly accepts S, then for all but infinite, for all but finitely many Ns, M strongly accepts S with the extension of the singleton N. And the proof idea is that if not, 
Then we're going to let n be the set of n's in M greater than max s, where M rejects Sorry? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> All right, so if, if this is not true, then of course you can make this set. This is going to be infinite. And and reject S, which is a contradiction to strongly accepting S. All right, so then to finish the proof, of the Nash-Williams theorem, we're going to first fix an M, deciding all of its finite subsets. And such that it has two properties. Oh, and such that uh, for each S in M, if M strongly accepts S, then M strongly accepts S union singleton n for all n's in M above max of S. Okay, and I'll call this property star. Okay, so then we have two possibilities, either M rejects empty set or M strongly accepts empty set. And we get our conclusion both ways. So if M rejects the empty set, then um, F restrict to M is empty. And now I should give you some notation. So it's right here. Okay. So F restrict to M is the set of members of F, which are subsets of M. Okay. So then we have, um, right, since there is no T in F not contained in M, which is end extending empty set. Okay. So, so in this case, we have F restrict to M contained in F1, so we've got a monochromatic subfront. Okay, so it's a front on M is monochromatic in F1. Uh, the other possibility is that M strongly accepts empty set. Right, then prove by induction on the side that for all S's in M, we have M um, strongly accepts S, right? And this is by um, star. 
Okay, so if you apply star to empty set, you show that all singletons must be strongly accepted. Now you apply star to singletons, all doubletons must be strongly accepted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, sort of basic high school induction proof. And, um, and so what you get is since F, this is the only place this proof is using Nash Williams property. Because if you had a T and F restrict to M, then there is going to be a T prime in F naught, T prime compatible or comparable with T and Nash Williams. Is going to imply t prime has to equal t. Okay. All right, so that is basically the proof of the Nash Williams theorem. Why I gave it because it's an it's a an example of combinatorial forcing, which is the basis for a bunch of other proofs in this area, and it's the simplest of them. So I could actually put the proof on the board and give you a flavor of that. Okay. Yes? I don't believe so. I think it's just next to N, which is like natural numbers. Okay. Uh, you know my question. The Matthias generic. Is this Matthias force? This is not Matthias. Um, no. Well, not not yet. Size. Not yet. No, but if you, I'm saying if you do, if you have them fires. Um, sure, then it will decide this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This, this, this is not as complex as Matthias forcing. Um, I think just from uh, open determinacy, you can get a weaker result. Just to, you know, all long enough initial segments of them have the same color, you know, beyond some root. Uh -huh, I'm just curious, uh -huh, uh -huh. has anyone looked at the meta mathematics of this of this result? Is it as strong as Pi zero one determinants? Uh, this one I don't know. No, I'm just saying you play a game where you know you try to you, you know the good guys try to make sure you keep extending yeah. the shot with the same color. And yeah. If you if you have a strategy, then great. You know, if not, then you get a point where beyond there you can't get that color, so you must be getting the other color. You get a right. you get a weaker result. What? There is there is a, the meta mathematics is strange because you oh. have a difference between two and three colors. Oh, it's not the same. That's, the statement, the statement, the statement is not the same strength. Yeah. Two colors and three colors. They, they, it's actually open. Well, but you're what's you're keeping the mm. secret. What is the strength of two colors? No, two colors is quite low. I think it's like it's in the ACA not or something. Mm. Oh, it's not. Okay. Oh, uh, it's less than. Yeah, yeah. the open term. And three is a no. Three is a no. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but maybe that's also trumped by open term. Yeah. I mean, it's implied. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But this is. Right. This is. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Could we have some knowledgeable people in the audience? <laughs> Okay, so the ex uh, first extension of this then was by Galvin and Perkri. Um, Perkri being my advisor from whom I did not actually learn this. How's thing. he doing? Right He's doing right. He's doing all well. I, I saw him a couple years ago. Uh, not yet. Not that I know of. Uh, so then they bumped up the clope into Borel. And uh, Silver uh, bumped it up to analytic. And... Publication dates don't always follow <laughs> from dates when work is done. And, um, and so the optimal extension of this was by Ellen Tuck. 
and Ellen Tuck um, introduced a topology which refines the metric topology and which basically characterizes what it means to be Ramsey via the topology. And so we're going to talk about what is the Ellen Tuck topology. It is uh, basic open sets which now look like Matthias forcing. Um, where you have a finite head and infinite tail and your basic open set has to extend the finite head and be contained in the infinite tail. And in the Ellen Tech topology now, when we fix this topology, we say that X is Ramsey with respect to the Ellen Tech topology if for every basic open set there's going to be a member of that basic open set where this smaller basic open set is either in X or disjoint from X. So that's your partition property there, your 0, 1 coloring. And we'll say that X is Ramsey null if the second clause holds always. All right. And then Ellen Tech proved that um, every subset of the bare space with the property of bare with respect to the Ellen Tuck topology is Ramsey and the meager sets in this topology are Ramsey null. Okay and I'm writing this as a triple because that's how Stavo presents it in his book and we'll talk about what's this R very soon. All right. So Matthias forcing connections, um, basically the same thing, right? You've got uh, conditions which are finite. Something just moved. Okay. Um, so it has conditions which are finite heads and infinite tails, and uh, you want um, the max to be less than the min, or you could just say x is end extending a. It works the same way both ways. And then our partial ordering is saying that B is going to N extend A and Y is going to be contained in X and the part of B above A must come from X. Okay. So this is equivalent to forcing using the basic open sets um, in the Matthias, Matthias space with inclusion as the partial order. And connections with forcing and ultrafilters, okay, so definition, uh, an ultrafilter is going to be Ramsey if it satisfies the Ramsey property via members of the ultrafilter. And when you take Matthias forcing or Ellen Tuck space and mod out by finite initial segments, you end up with a forcing equivalent to the Boolean algebra P omega mod finite, which forces a Ramsey ultrafilter. If you don't know that, it's a great exercise and showing dense sets and using Ramsey's theorem. And um, Ramsey ultrafilters were the first ultrafilters to be um, investigated in this sense of complete combinatorics of blasts because they're the strongest ultrafilters. <laughs> they're the best candidates for having complete combinatorics. And um, one of the ways to and Kiesler, Tukey. It's the same as selective, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ramsey ultrafilters are the same thing as selective, are the same thing as P point plus Q point. Yes. Yep. So they have the strongest partition properties or selection properties or any properties that I know of. Um, and I'm going to um, phrase this in Stavo's terminology right now and we'll do blasts later. Um, one way is to say that if there's a super compact cardinal then any Ramsey ultrafilter is actually generic for this forcing over L of R. Okay. So complete combinatorics means that you can completely combinatorially characterize which ultrafilters are going to be Ramsey over L of R. Uh, another nice property, okay, if we take an ultrafilter U, M U is going to denote Matthias forcing where the tails are in the ultrafilter. M is equivalent to first forcing by P omega mod finite, 
and then forcing by Matthias with that new ultra filter, new Ramsey ultra filter. Okay, so now we are going to get abstract and key properties from the Ellen text space, which can be abstractive, give you a notion of a topological Ramsey space. And these were first put together, consolidated by Carlson and Simpson, and then later uh, Todorcevich put together a refinement of their presentation into these four axioms. So we're going to go through this yeah, presentation in a second. So yes. you say if you're if you have the bare property null no topology when you're Ramsey. Yes. And conversely not. No, if and only if. If and only if. Well, and only if. On it's coming. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, was that not there for the. Well, I might hold it open. Um, yeah, it's not there in the slide, but it is if and only if. It is, it is if and only if, actually. Um, completely Ramsey, I believe, doesn't uh, talk about the head, the finite head. It, it does. Isn't the language the other way around? Is it completely Ramsey where you quantify over the A's? Uh, I thought that no. was kind of yes. That's true. Complete should be yes. stronger. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, so, yes, you're, you're right. You're right, you're right. So, so, so this, this, um, Outside of Stevo's book would be called completely Ramsey. Yeah, that's right. Because you might be Ramsey for a dumb reason off on the, off on the side. Right, 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 right. Yeah, everywhere. I think he probably didn't want to write completely throughout the whole book. <laughs> but yes. Okay. Uh, let's go back to there. Okay, so now abstract topological Ramsey spaces. So we have R, which is some set, this, which is some quasi-order, which in practice is usually a partial order, and some restriction map, this R, is really a collection of restriction maps R sub n, which are basically taking your finite approximations, your nth finite approximation to a member of the space. And the, the notation ARN is the nth approximations of members of your space. AR is just the collection of all approximations to members of your space. And we're going to define this notation to mean that A equals the nth approximation of Y for some n. Okay. So this square bracket with a square subset with no equals. Okay. And in our abstract topological Ramsey space setup, the basic open sets are defined the same way as in the Ellen Tuck space. And the topology that's generated by these basic open sets is going to be a refinement of the metric topology on the product of the ARNs, where we're equating ARN, think of that as like the n size subsets of natural numbers. So that's the analogy. So this would you know, normally be like the product of omega to the n, which gives you infinite sequences and its limit. Uh, in the abstract sense, we want to take the product of the finite approximations. And you can just give each ARN the discrete topology and then take the product topology. So R, what is R? It's the, uh, R is some Ramsey space. But it, it would be, it would be uh, the Allen Tuck open set, uh, basic open sets in a concrete instance? Or what? is it space itself? I mean, what's no, the, this is a space. So, so in the concrete example, this is omega to the omega. This is the bare oh, space. Oh, this is what it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, what's, and what is the quasi order R? Uh, that would be subset. Subset? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then R is isomorphic to this product? Or? No, no, no. It's a subset. We'll get there. Okay. I have well, some more details. Yeah. Well, R and what are the values? The values are finite uh, in some sense? Or yeah, the abstract? values are going to be finite. It's abstract, but it must be finite if it's going to fit in the schema. Okay. Are they finite subsets of N? Or? No. But they're finite subsets of whatever is your member of R. Mm -hmm. 
my goal here is to get people over the notation issue. <laughs> Because that seems to be the most, I mean, once you get into it, it's really... <laughs> Before we had the square brackets inclusion mean an initial segment, right? Yeah. And now it's... Now it's, now it's abstract. It's substance. Uh, not really. You'll, you'll, you'll just, see... It's formal. It's formal. This is all formal. Yeah. This is all formal right now. But it is a tree order? Not necessarily. Okay, Sometimes. <laughs> yes, you should assume nothing. Assume nothing. <laughs> yeah. So in this abstract setup, we say that X is Ramsey, or if you wish, completely Ramsey. Um, if for every non-empty basic open set, there's going to be a member so that you have uh, inclusion or disjointness. Okay, so what does member mean now? Can I see that again? The abstract setting? Yes. Yeah. Let me put that up here. Okay. All right. Yes, um, so now a definition of a topological Ramsey space in the abstract, given this setup with the structure uh, is to be if every subset of R with the bare property with respect to this abstract L and type topology uh, is Ramsey in this sense. So if you just think of Ellen Tuck's space right here, it's just rehashing what you already have seen. OK, so now the axioms. All right, so I'm going to put up Ellen Tuck's space here so you can parse with something you know. Um, A11 says that the zeroth approximation must be the empty set, right? And in the Ellen Tuck space, the, the nth approximation is just the first n members. So R0 should be the empty set. Okay. Uh, the second one says that if you have A not equal to B, then there must have been some finite approximation where you can tell. Right? So of course, if you have two infinite sets which are not equal, they're going to disagree some finite approximation through. And Rn of A equals Rm of B implies N equals M. Well, if you have two infinite sets and you have M, R, the nth approximation equals the mth approximation, they must be M equals N. And, um, and then they must be equal below there. Actually, there's a cryptic remark in Fedorovich's book where he says that you can replace Rn by the sequence of m for m less than yes. n, or does he mean less or equal to m? Less than. Yeah, or I always wonder about that. Why the hell is that? Uh, that doesn't, uh, I don't know. They, or maybe I don't remember, but OK. But does that, I mean, if you if you replace, do these acts, is it, does he mean that these accents remain true if you just replace yeah. by the sequence of the previous ones? Or? Yeah. But don't you need to, but I guess you need to go with less or equal. Uh, well, if you think, um, let me get back to you there, but I don't think it's material. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think it would really change anything. Oh, you just might be off by one index. Um, okay. But it oh, is. Basically, the point is that the, you can tell the structure of the mth approximation by all the mm -hmm. approximations before it. Yeah. Uh, Quasi-ordering. So A2 
there's going to be a quasi-ordering, which in the case of l -intact topology is going to be just the subset. And um, we want, here's what you were talking about before, the finitization. Uh, if you have a member of a R, there must only be finitely many things below it. Right. And of course, in um, the Ellen Tech space, we have this being just plain old subset. So a finite set only has finitely many subsets. And that's what this one is saying. And two is saying if you have A less or equal to B, and you have, if it's going to be if and only if every nth approximation of A comes from within some nth approximation of B. <laughs> And A, B, and C being finite sets with A, an initial segment of B, and B contained in C, then there's going to be a D, which is an initial segment of C, which contains A. What is initial segment? I mean, again, it's part of the structure, or is it the uh, it Right here, initial segment means there is some K, so that oh, D right. equals RK of C. Of course. Right. Same. And why does it say there is a quasi order? I mean, it doesn't. Because you're going to need to use this quasi ordering when you're doing um, fusion constructions and arguments. Why is it part of the structure? Why didn't you say later that? I don't know. Structure? You can ask Stable. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it somehow, can you derive it from the rest or something like that? No. Usually it's pretty clear what it should be from the no, rest. I mean, abstractly? No. No, okay. Uh, no, mm -hmm. not, not abstractly. Uh, and then the depth map is telling you where is the least n so that uh, you can find a inside of b. So in Ellen Tuck, the depth map is just the first place where you see the set a. Okay, and then a3 is talking about... Um, so, so this, this is now an important axiom which sometimes holds you up and sometimes doesn't when you're doing proofs. The times it holds you up is when you have, it's going to be hard to explain, um, but sort of some infinite feel to it. And if A3 is not going to be an issue if you have a finite feel to it. Like, I'll, I can show you in some examples later what I mean by that. What? It's not an issue with hyperbolic. No, no, that's a finite feel because when you're in a finite approximation, each thing finitely, you don't have to like look into the future infinitely much to find out what you have already. <laughs> Very meta mathematically. <laughs> okay. Um, so these are when, when you're doing these fusion um, proofs, like when you're doing the proof of the abstract Ellen Tuck theorem, and you're going through this combinatorial forcing abstractly, like we did with Nash Williams, you're going to be doing some fusion sequences because you want to do some bit for a finite bit, shrink the tail, and continue extending. And this is the axiom that allows you to do that. Okay. And then lastly, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so this one's, let me just sort of draw a picture here. So, A31. It's saying, let's see, so if you have, if A is going to be some subset of B, and you have, here is B, and here is A, so this is your N. Then for every member A, which is extending oh, this, this bit into B, then so you have A, just a second. So this is, um, so if you have this bit of B, where this is the first place you can get to A inside of B, then you have, if A is end extending this, then you can also end extend from here into A, 
and be non-empty. Right? And it seems like a weird thing until you actually go and try to do some fusion arguments and then you realize why you need it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then two is actually even a little bit more strange but also very important. Um, if you have A, which is a subset of B, and an A a subset of A, let's see here. So... Not really. <laughs> it allows you to. Um, yeah. So, so, so what it what it allows you to do is um, you you you're wanting to build these finite approximations, which and what you also want to do is you want to know that for every finite subset of this finite approximation, when you extend it into the tail, you had the right thing, mm -hmm. and. So you're you're always having to go back inside of here and thin, but you don't want to change this, right? Right. Yeah. Um, can I skip two? Do you want me to go through two? Can you just like give us an intuition of why do you need to shrink uh, a? Why do you need an a prime? Here. Uh, let's see. So we've got if a is in. So we've got a. A subset of B. So we've got A. Let's see there. Okay, this is A. B was some bigger thing. And we want to take, let's see, here's Rn of B, is this piece here. Um, then there's an A prime in here, extending so that the empty set, um, it's sort of for the same reason because. I mean, I think the point is that the A prime could uh, look wrong on depths of little a. So you want to chop off a finite right. of A prime. So that you can attach the a, because at, at least in the usual thing, a prime, the min of a prime has to be above the max of little a, right? And um, that not the case. That's not. Yeah, it's not the case here. Now we're thinking of a prime as end extending little a, or at least containing little a. But still, the problem would be that a prime could look wrong on depth. Right. Of a. Right. So right. Well, uh, okay. So, I. I I think a tree example is actually the best for that because it, the, the point is that you want to um, you want to be able to take an a that's in you know end extending here you know say say you got some a like this and it was good like it was one color for whatever you cared about at the time you want to be able to extend above here into b but so that it behaves like um, a or it's at least containing the a primes. There. It's like we need to complete A on a, on a finite segment with all the elements of R and of B yeah. that are not in the A. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, and then finally we've got the pigeonhole, which we began with. So um, the pigeonhole, so for A and AR we have A. Um, denoting the first k where it's a finite, a kth approximation. Um, so in the Ellen Tech space, this is just the cardinality of A. Uh, for n greater than the length of A, Rn of A, comma, big A, is going to denote the collection of all Bs of length n, which are end extending A and contained in A. And um, by this notation, I mean. Is, is, that, is that actually the image of the set square root of AA under AARN? Uh, sorry, what? I, I just couldn't track. Is, so RN square root of AA. Yes. Is that actually the image of square root of AA under AARN? 
in a sense, yes. I, I, that's probably the best way to think about it. Although, like, yes. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Right. So pigeonhole, finally. Okay, so pigeonhole principle. Um, so if you have. So I'm sorry, but I said, why is it? How is AR defined in It is the collection of all finite approximations of members of the space. Yeah. Yes, so pigeonhole principle. So this is. This Rn of square brackets, something in the way it's written here, it also depends on this order of less than three. So I'm. Yeah, but, but the, it's. Okay, I understand what the problem is here. <laughs> the problem is that I took this from some paper where I like define these things. So let me just put for you Rn of, what did I say, AA? Yeah, this is going to be exactly um, what Daniel said. It's the Rn of, let's say, x such that x is in here. All right, so pigeonhole, pigeonhole. Right, so this, the setup is a little bit different than what you might be thinking, but the pigeonhole principle is basically the same as the very first slide uh, in the case of the Ellen Tech topology, but we're going to set it up a little bit differently. So we've got some member B here. And we've got some member A, okay? So this is going to be the depth of A and B, all right? And we're taking O to be a subset of AR, A plus one. So here we've got A is two. So here we've got O is a subset of AR three, okay? And we're looking to find some end extension of this finite approximation so that every one more piece added to A has the same color. Okay. And the reason it's set up that way rather than just saying let's find extensions of A into B is again because you're trying to do fusion sequences with this. So you're, you've got your coloring of X's and O's, and you take one infinite subset. In the case of the Ellen Tech space, you've got the pigeonhole principle. That, that's not that B in the second line of your call. That, that B is a, that's a natural number. So that is the restriction of This is. Um, no. Yes, this is a natural number, and then you're restricting B to that natural number. So it's R n rich. R lower end x, blah, 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 of B. Yeah. So it's right. It's this. Can I see it? It's OK. When you introduced this notation? Which notation? I don't know, the one that Rafa was talking about. <laughs> let me let me go on because I have no. now half an hour no, and uh, and I want to go over some other stuff because I think other people may be interested um, <laughs> and we can talk more so um, abstract Allentuck theorem says that if you have these four axioms and R is closed in ARN with that product topology then you have this really nice abstraction of Ellen Tuck's theorem. Okay, and this is what I've been talking about. I've said that several times. Okay, so what are topological Ramsey spaces useful for? 
Um, for one thing, they get at the heart of what is the combinatorics that you're dealing with, especially enforcing. Um, they will give you complete combinatorics for ultra filters which satisfy some weak partition properties. And then this is how I got into it. It was by finding um, precise Tukey and Rudin Kiesler structures. And once you have a Ramsey space giving you an ultra filter, you can use it to find Ramsey degrees of the ultra filters, which would be extremely hard to do by their original forcings. Um, showing preservation of by side by side Sachs forcings. Uh, Bonnick space problems, and this is what I'll talk about uh, more tomorrow. And uh, the Ramsey degree of an ultra filter would be if you have something like this, um, let's say whatever you have some number, and so if you if you partition. If you take a coloring of n size subsets into k, then there's going to exist an x in your u so that c restrict to x has less than or equal to d colors. Okay. So a Ramsey degree is going to be when you're not a Ramsey ultra filter, right? Ramsey. Ramsey has degree one, and then you can go up. Yeah. All right, so some classic examples of topological Ramsey spaces. Um, there's the Ellen Tuck space we've been talking about for a while. And then there is Carlson Simpson. And maybe let me get a show of hands who has heard of the Carlson Simpson space. OK. So it is very easy to define. <coughs> and it's a useful example to think of. So it's the space of all um, surjections, I'm going to say rigid, surjections from omega onto mm -hmm. omega. Okay. So you take all the rigid surjections. Rigid means that um, you have to hit 0 before you hit 1, before you hit 2, before you hit 3. This just gets rid of anything that would get in the way of having a Ramsey theorem. And um, the less or equal relation is composition or um, um, yeah, thickening. I'm not thinking of the word. The uh, un unrefining, <laughs> coarsening. Thank you. So, um, so we have x less or equal to y if and only if x is coarser than y. And when you have a equivalence, uh, you have, you know, if you have some x, which is an equivalence uh, relation or rigid surjection, you may have something like this. Right? Then the finite approximations go by, here's the first zero, um, sorry, zero, first one, first two, et cetera, like that. So this is a handy topological Ramsey space to know about. And it basically, it has a lot of properties opposite from Ellen Tuck because Ellen Tuck goes by injections and this goes by surjections, which makes them behave quite differently. What is coarser? I don't know. A coarser equivalence, equivalence relation. And then the Millikan space, I'm going to skip Prummel and Voigt. The Millikan space, you may have seen this before.
So you're basically looking at, so X is going to be um, a collection where each XI is a finite set. And for all i, the max of xi is going to be less than the min of xi plus 1. Okay, And this space is the collection of all such x. Okay. So there are infinite block sequences. They come up in Bonnach space theory as um, Ramsey theory for bases. And um, the lesser equal, I'm going to just draw it. So let's say this is an x. We have y is going to be lesser equal to x if y has taken every block in y is some gluing of some blocks in x. And it may skip blocks, so it may skip some. So this would be, say, y0, and this would be y1 being both of these, et cetera. And that's the, the partial ordering on this, this space. space. Yes, yes. So Matei forcing would be this, um, where instead of having finite approximations in the sense of the Ramsey space, you just glue them together and make one finite set. So these spaces are being axioms. Yes, yes, yes. These are. And do they then all satisfy the equivalence between complete Ramsiness and the yes. property? Yes. This is just an abstract thing. This is just so these axioms. these people proved this, you know. Hands on. Hands on, and, and then a general exactly abstract result that covers all. Right. Right. And that's the thank you, Sai, because that's the but point the here. Sets are completely right. Yes, but moreover, in the Ellen Tuck abstract Ellen Tuck topologies on these spaces, yeah. that I mean, bear. Yeah, I mean that Burrell sets in these topologies. Yeah, but even the property of bears also are Ramsey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so what the what the abstract Ramsey. Um, theory does is it takes all of these, you know, 20 or so results that people worked really hard to prove by hand or by many ideas and it, it subsumes, well, no, <laughs> but it, it, it takes the best of all of them together and the puts them together. The yes, the analytic follows from this because oh. property of bear in the Ellen Tech topology subsumes analytic in the metric. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so these are some things um, to hold on to in case you want to think of what, what are topological Ramsey spaces looking like. These are some quintessential examples. Okay, and in a paper with a former postdoc, um, we have an example schema which encompasses these four um, Ramsey spaces. So they're all sort of instantiations of a broader schema within them. All right, so now let's talk about ultrafilters. So given a topological Ramsey space, you can make a naturally induced partial order, which is like mod finite in its behavior. And it's defined this way by saying that there's a finite approximation so that if you start with that finite approximation into Y, then you must be contained in AX. Okay, and under some weak assumptions, which Maharas puts in this paper, this will give you a sigma closed forcing, which is going to behave similarly to Ellen Tuck mod finite. Why is this strong? What? Why is this strong? Why is this strong? What? Yeah. Okay. No matter why. Why is what stronger than what? Why is the stronger condition? Yes, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm back with the Goldstein notation. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, this will force a generic, a generic filter on R. It may not be an ultra filter because R might not be right for ultra filters, but when you take the set of first approximations as a countable base set, then you will generate an ultra filter on that. So this will be generating this ultra filter U, where this is a member of U if and only if there's a member of the generic filter so that AR1 on X is U. So this is the set of R1 of Y where Y is less or equal to X. Okay. So um, selective co-ideals, I'm going to go through this a little bit fast because I'm not going to concentrate on it. But um, there's a notion of selective there are actually now about five notions of selective in the literature, but this is the correct one. <laughs> okay, this is the one people should refer back to, um, which built they got to it because of the other four. <laughs> okay, and um, so a co-ideal on R is going to be selective if indexing by the member the finite approximation than A rather than indexing by finite sets as you would on omega, uh, there's going to be a U which diagonalizes all of these. Okay. And um, forcing is going to always add a selective co-ideal and a nice connection between Matthias forcing and these general Ramsey spaces is that they have that same property that if you force with the Ramsey space, it's the same as forcing mod this almost reduction and then taking that generic filter, and I probably should have called that G there, taking that generic filter and taking the tails in G with this filter Matthias forcing. Just forcing with the Ramsey space? It means just forcing with the Ramsey space. Just with the, with the, with the order. Yeah, with the partial, yeah, quasi-order. Usually partial order. This this is a partial <laughs> order. Um, so in L and Tuck space, it'd be infinite sets with subset. Matthias forcing with respect to so basic open sets in the Ramsey space where tails are in you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so in the presence of a supercompact cardinal, you get yeah. complete combinatorics. Complete combinatorics meaning in the sense that every selective co-ideal contained in R is going to be generic for this force. Over L of R, right? Over L of R, yeah. I what should have said that. Ah, the role of the super is sort of a black, box. Of a black box. Yeah, it's a theorem of wooden. Yeah. And then extended by Stavo, and then extended here. Um, it, 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 I've heard that you don't, but I haven't seen a proof. <laughs> this is what you call complete commodity. Yeah, yeah. This is one one way of 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 formulating it. Another is to formulate it over Hod. Mm -hmm. Because it's only complete because the forcing is homogeneous, right? I mean, just saying you're generic for forcing doesn't tell you much if the forcing is inhomogeneous. But in this case, they're homogeneous. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about topological Ramsey spaces dense in forcings. How did I get into this in the first place? Um, it was by looking at, I was working on ultrafilters and two key types of ultrafilters, and I wanted to get a better handle on certain forcings, which were sigma closed, that were adding weekly Ramsey ultrafilters or other ultrafilters that had some weak partition properties. And in the process, it led to some nice uh, consequences, one of which is consolidating more disparate things into a general framework. Um, the one I like the best is uh, really understanding the combinatorial essence of the forcings via topological Ramsey spaces. 
um, some new canonical equivalence relations, which I'm not going to get to today, and um, properties of L of R of U, where you've done you you've obtained this ultrafilter by some forcing, but it's not Ramsey. Um, and now we will, so I'm calling these inner topological Ramsey spaces because they're inside, dense inside, some forcing. So now I'm going to start into the pretty picture part of the talk. <coughs> and these are going to be motivated by some forcings of Laflamme. So here's Laflamme's forcing, okay. And I'm not really going to go into it, but the point is that it's nice, but it's not super nice, All right? So this is a forcing which will give you a weekly Ramsey ultrafilter, which means that when you color into finitely many colors, the pair sets, you can find a member of your ultrafilter that has at most two colors, but not necessarily one. And he's strengthening the subset relation by blocking the infinite sets in terms of one, two, three, four, five, and then saying that y1 is going to be less or equal to x if and only if um, each m block is contained in some n block. All right. So it's like Ellen Tuck, but more restrictive. And so this is what I just said. And in his thesis, he proved that this has complete combinatorics. This is the original way of stating complete combinatorics. By BLAST, if you have a Malo cardinal and some Levy generic over V, then any ultrafilter, which is not Ramsey, but rapid, um, and satisfies some combinatorial property, then it's going to be K, K generic over there. Okay, this combinatorial property you can read out from the Ramsey space that I'm going to put up very soon. So anyway, this is what a member of Laflamme's forcing would look like. This would be a y less or equal 1 of x, where you could have two different blocks of y in coming from one block of x. Okay, and now if you want to try to make a Ramsey space out of this, you can't allow this sort of thing, but... Uh, it doesn't matter because it's dense to avoid such things. So this is now turning this into a tree type, and we're taking blocks and gluing them at the bottom to make a very wide, short tree. And so now instead of Laflamme's forcing, so what I'm giving here, if it's not apparent, is a topological Ramsey space, which is dense inside Laflamme's forcing. And because of the Ramsey space properties, mm -hmm. Stavo and I were able to show some exact um, results on Tukey structures. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at here is what's the structure of a member. So this is like a first extension of the Ellen Tuck space in complexity. Okay. So you've got trees of height 2. They're infinitely wide. This is going to be a member of the space because it has the same structure as the original one. And this is also another member of the space. And this x is less or equal to y. So what this does is it changes the strengthened partial ordering of Laflamme on the bare space to a structure requiring certain structure for members of your space and then the partial ordering just becomes inclusion again. So it's like shifting the order to structure and then if you have the right structure your order <coughs> becomes very simple. So this is a subtree not in the space because blocks came from within one block and you can see this structurally because this tree has five terminal nodes right it should go one two three four five you can throw these out yeah <clears throat> so so in one piece of, um, of research we showed that this is a topological Ramsey space and as if you take any <laughs> member of, of Claude's forcing you can make a member uh, you can make this below it so it's dense inside. 
therefore forcing equivalent, <coughs> and you get a generic uh, filter, which is also, again, re weakly RAMZ. And one of the benefits of doing this is that you can get quicker, easier proofs of these <coughs> RAMZ degrees for ultra filters. So um, Sonia Navarro-Flores did a master's thesis with me, and one of the things she did was to find Ramsey degrees for ultra filters which were not found before or which were found before but by some very messy means. <coughs> okay. And then if you're interested, there's some more work on this uh, for the whole hierarchy of Laflamme's forcings. In each of them we find some dense subset which is a Ramsey space. Okay. What was Lafon doing? He was trying to find complete combinatorics for ultra filters which are not Ramsey. Oh, I guess you said that. Probably. <laughs> so, so his was the first way of Laflam did this because he wanted to find a forcing that gives you a weakly Ramsey ultra filter with complete combinatorics, and then he made this whole hierarchy of weakening the Ramsey degree. What is weakly Ramsey again? Two, not one. Two, right, two, two not one. Two you can get down to two colors, but not one. It's still an ultra filter, but not Ramsey ultra filter. Yeah. But still way better than your generic P point. Okay. Um, let's see. So we're going to have now topological Ramsey spaces from Freisei classes. Um, which consolidated a forcing of glass and some collections of forcings by Baumgartner and Taylor. And also, you get some new classes of ultra filters, which are P points with some weak partition properties. So, so this next <laughs> collection sort of subsumed some other work, but then also generated some new ultra filters in the process. So here's an n-square forcing of Andreas, where basically your members are subsets of omega cross omega, and for each n you want x to contain an n by n-square somewhere. Okay. And the, the reason that Andreas did this was to force a p-point with two rudin kiesler incompatible predecessors. And of course, you get the incompatible predecessors by projecting to the first coordinate or projecting to the second coordinate. And now a Ramsey space, which is dense inside his forcing, looks like this, where you set it up. You're not going to work with all of omega cross omega. You're going to just work with squares. Right? And then you want to take subsequences, which have the same structure. So this is going to be your first approximation. Um, in the green, it would. this is the second approximation because you've got a one square and a two square, right? And you've got your third approximation, etc. So it's starting, we're trying to fit this, you know, what is dense inside Andreas's forcing that's going to fit into this A1 through A4. Okay. And in this paper, we um, did that. And from that, you can find the Ramsey degree to be 6 for the forced ultra filter, just by sort of structurally looking at what are the blocks, and then using this abstract Nash-Williams theorem. And you can do this for higher dimensions by taking your nth block to have you know, dimension 3, if 3 is fixed, or you can even make them go in higher and higher dimensions as n grows. Did you mean in most six or in six? Hmm? Here? In most six. At most six colors. Most six, most six know colors. It's, it's no, no, I do. It is six. Oh, it the, is the, exactly the, six. This is the Ramsey degree is six. Okay, you can't do five. Yeah, no. Um, okay, an ultra, uh, K-arrow ultra filter. So these are... Um, Asymmetric partition relations, where this means that mm -hmm. if you color a pair of sets of omega into two colors, either there's a member in the first color in U, 
or there's a subset of size K in the second color. Okay, and Baumgartner and Taylor um, constructed a bunch of forcings in this paper where they get K arrow but not K plus one arrow ultrafilters and their setup looks a lot like creature forcings where they're using norms and um, and, and if, you, if you delve into what they're doing, you can pick out a Ramsey space from these norms. And actually, it becomes quite simple when you look at it from a Ramsey space point of view. So here's the idea. Um, instead of bothering with norms, we'll just take the class of all finite ordered triangle free graphs or k-click free graphs. And string them out so that you have the Ramsey property between the nth, n plus first, and n plus second blocks. Because you can, because of Nesha, Troll, and Riddle. And then a sub a, um, y below x is going to be another infinite block sequence where the structure is the same as the original. Okay, and by doing all this, you know, structure, get down to the, what looks like the original, you're basically getting rid of anything that can screw up the pigeonhole principle. That's what this is doing. And let's see, so, oops, so you can find, um, yeah, application to Ramsey degrees. So basically, I said this before, but you can find Ramsey degrees for ultra filters if you have enough information about the Ramsey structures. Okay, so in five minutes, um, I'm going to talk about the motivation for this, and then the rest will just be online in case you want to. So Rudin Kiesler, reducibility, long studied, has to do with functions from omega to omega. Tukey reducibility, not so long studied on ultra filters, long studied on partial orders. And it has to do with functions from basically power set of omega into power set of omega. And the question is, how do the two relate? How closely are they related? And what can we say <coughs> about the rudin kiesler structures inside the two key structures? And um, can we say anything more about them? So there are two main types of results in this area. One is proving embedding results. And this recent work of Shayla and Raghavan um, subsumes quite a lot of the prior work, but not all of it into saying that you can embed p omega mod fin into the two key types of p points. An initial two key structure is going to mean a two key downwards closed structure. So getting a precise structure. And topological Ramsey spaces are useful for finding these, right? That's what they're good at. Um, Fubini product definitions there. Uh, if you, um, so these are some of the known initial Tukey and Rudin Kiesler structure types. And basically, these break down into three areas. So the first area is what is the initial Tukey structure? What is it? The second is you can actually deduce from the methods what the initial Rudin Kiesler structure is. You sort of get that as a byproduct. And the third one, is what are exactly the structures of the Rudin Kiesler types inside these two key types of the initial structure? And we get exact results for all of these. So in this paper, um, it's shown that uh, Ramsey ultrafilters are two key minimal in this, by means of showing that everything two key reducible to an, a Ramsey ultrafilter is actually isomorphic to a Fubini iterate of it, okay? And for this forcing I showed you before of Laflamme, um, we get initial two key structures downwards alpha plus one for each countable ordinal alpha, same for Rudin Kiesler, and then moreover within these alpha plus one two key structures we know exactly what is the Rudin Kiesler types and their structure 
inside. So in these cases, you get exactly Aleph one many Reed and Kiesler classes, which is sort of cool because usually you're stuck with C many. Okay, um, and then in our Friday class work, we get some wide Tukey structures. So the finite Boolean algebras plus omega to the less than omega ordered by inclusion. And if you take a product of Friday classes, the initial Rudin-Kieser classes are given by isomorphism types there. So this is an example where your rudin kiesler initial structures can be very, very different from your initial Tukey structures. And then a similar thing where you know what is the Tukey type, what are the exact rudin kiesler types inside these Tukey types. So a comparison there. Okay, so this is a general proof outline of how it works. So you take a Ramsey space. And you let U be the filter, the generic filter, forced by R with this almost reduction. And then take some V, which is Tukey, below U. And you want to know what is V in comparison with U and anything else. So you let F be some monotone cofinal map. And we'll assume that V has ultrafilter base set omega, because we can. And then you prove that F is actually continuous. So it's approximated by some finitary map on the <laughs> finite approximations. So now we're going to take F to be the front of minimal finite approximations where F is, is non-empty. Okay, so now we're defining a front and we're going to transfer this original co-final map to a map on the front. And this is what allows everything to work. Now we're going to define a new ultrafilter on the base set F. And the members of this new ultrafilter are these F restrict to X's. And you prove that this is an ultrafilter. And then, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> I mean, it really is because it's like, how, why in the world should that be true? But it is. And, and I checked it. Um, <laughs> and it's published, so hopefully the referee checked it too. Um, so gee, that, that funky map we got this way on the front, on this revised ultra filter, actually is equal to V. And um, and this ultra filter is rudin kiesler equivalent to V. So now it's a matter of what is this G on, on here doing, right? So this is something we left out of this talk, is these Ramsey classification theorems, which are extensions of pudlock riddle theorem on the Elentex space, which is an extension of the erdos rado theorem, which is something I can state, which says that um, if you have an equivalence relation on the k-tuples of, of natural numbers, then there's going to be some subset of k and some infinite subset, so that when you restrict to that infinite subset, projections to this finite set give you the equivalence relation. Okay, so it's, this is a very extended version of that. And then uh, you apply this function g on f, <coughs> Um, with this Ramsey classification, and then you do a bunch of decoding to figure out what the heck are these things in terms of isomorphism types and Fabini products and stuff like that. And so that gives you the proof, and a general proof, which works for a large class of spaces but not all spaces, is in this paper. And now there's only 30 slides left for you to read, and I think I'll stop there. Okay, but before you stop, can you yes. just tell me what you just proved? Ah, yes. I just proved general proof outline of exact rudin kiesler and Tukey structures. So given an ultrafilter, which is forced by topological Ramsey space, hopefully dense inside of some 
partial ordering that you originally cared about. You want to know what is exactly the structure of everything Tukey below it. And it is exactly found, those, so those three pronged approaches, initial Tukey, initial Rudin Kiesler, what's Rudin Kiesler inside the initial Tukey is done this way. Okay, well, uh, we have Natasha for a week, so if you have any questions, please feel free to come back to them. There are any questions pressing right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if not, then let's thank Natasha. Okay. Yeah. Part two is... But that's not the next 35. No, the ne okay, so yeah, advertisement. Um, <laughs> tomorrow I'm talking about Ramsey theory on trees which is a connected but not completely the same talk. So no, I am not going to cover these 30 slides. <laughs> but they will be available.